Ladies and gentlemen, um, Jude, thank you. Very nice to be here. And I want to thank you for asking me to join you today. And I'm really very sorry that I couldn't be here earlier. Um, but as it happened, we had a meeting of the National Council of the Arts Council through this afternoon. So I've only been able to join very recently. Um, right now, making a speech on international engagement is understandably weighted with significance. We have to remember that we're leaving the EU and we're not leaving Europe. But nevertheless, the negotiations to leave the EU will bring into focus specific issues for the cultural world affecting artists and organizations. But the referendum has also reminded us of how valuable international work and exchange has become for the quality, for the diversity, and for the strength of our national culture. It is important that we should talk about the value of this international work, because it lies now at the heart of everything we do in the arts. And it explains why we need to be part of the debate around, for example, ease of movement for performers, artists, and creative practitioners. Engaging in this international conversation through exchange of ideas and people and being a player in world markets is critical to the artistic and to the economic vitality of British arts and cultural organizations. And it brings enormous benefit to British audiences. They should have the opportunity to experience the best of the international wherever they live. And last weekend, I saw for myself the impact of the Manchester International Festival now in its sixth edition, being brilliantly and imaginatively led by John McGrath. And it was playing out on the streets and the squares and was taking, literally taking over the city. So international partnerships there bringing new perspectives, new voices, are giving that community a shared experience and a confidence that will help it bounce back from adversity. Today I'd like to touch on the current EU situation and in particular what our research tells us are the issues of most concern to the artists and the organizations that the Arts Council funds. But I also want to look at the bigger picture, because what we are going through now is only one chapter in a history of cultural development and exchange. It's a human adventure, a story as old as our collective history, that over millennia has seen the ebb and flow of immigration and emigration, the beneficial influence of incoming cultures, and the export of British ideas and culture. And I'd like to share some news about what the Arts Council is doing to ensure that such exchange continues and flourishes and becomes even richer. So first, the current situation in negotiations to leave the EU. Last year, we published a report looking at the impact of the UK's proposed exit from the EU, EU from the perspective of the people that we invest in and support. We surveyed more than a thousand artists and organizations. For them, the important issues were funding, especially in some parts of the country that have benefited directly from EU funding and may not benefit in the future. As you will all know here, ease of movement, legal and regulatory frameworks, and trade with the EU and other countries. The vast majority of those surveyed would be affected by any additional barriers to ease of movement. So they felt it was particularly significant that we should secure the right conditions for artists and creative practitioners, such as curators and producers, to move, practice, collaborate, and learn from each other. This is all fundamental to international exchange and has become a cornerstone for the creative economy of the UK. Ensuring that ease of movement is, is complex 
and the present arrangements, irrespective of the EU question, are far from perfect. We should be looking at the current systems and procedures, whom they benefit and whom they disadvantage. The negotiation creates an opportunity for government to think how the flow of talent can be made as smooth as possible. How can we retain the conditions that currently work well and extend these to artists and creatives globally, including those coming for short working visits? This is vital if we are to retain the edge we have in highly competitive world markets. So the Arts Council is working with the Creative Industries Federation, with government, and with our European partners to try and find solutions that will make this movement more straightforward. A two-way flow of talent is crucial to the arts in Britain. It's the interaction of forces that has made British culture so rich and so increasingly complex. We owe much of how we see ourselves, especially, I would argue, our romantic side, to the perspective of incomers. Handel and Van Dyck came from Germany and the Low Countries to be favourites at a British court. I hope that the present British court might perhaps follow that example and invite such distinguished practitioners to come and work in this country. The lyrical vision of Britain in Michael Powell's films was scripted by Emmerich Pressburger, a Hungarian refugee. One of the major influences on the School of British Landscape Writing was a German, W.G. Max Sebald, whose Rings of Saturn is a personal journey down England's east coast. And where would the visual arts in this country be without the contribution made by artists like Frank Auerbach and Lucien Freud in one generation, Chris Afili, Mona Hatoum, or John Acumfra in another? The richness of the arts in Britain comes through a combination of strong local sensibilities and a willingness to absorb other cultural influences. Artists, writers, thinkers have come here from abroad and they have en enhanced our position as a resourceful nation that values tolerance and diversity within the body of society. That has given us a position and status in the 20th and 21st century global community. Right now, the arts need to work harder to become even more strongly representative of the diverse society that we have become. We all gain if we collaborate, fuse, subvert, recognize distinctions, and reinvent. We need to be more open, and we also need to make the journey out to acquire new experiences and to share our culture and our skills. Cultures that cut themselves off may become exquisite, like a rare breed of animal, but ultimately they stagnate and become irrelevant in a changing world. The public has not always had easy access to international work in this country. I'm just old enough to remember when it seemed to blow in once a year at the Edinburgh Festival or perhaps through Peter Dobyn's World Theatre Seasons. The Arts Council backed the first International Fest Edinburgh Festival in 1947 because in the words of the annual report of that date, it was the supreme example of the highest possible standards of performance. Not quite sure we'd write about the Edinburgh Festival in those terms today. The standards are very high, but we probably wouldn't limit them in, those way, in that way. But in the last 30 years, governments of all persuasions have seen the importance of international engagement. There was an upsurge of investment in the 1990s, which began with Glasgow's success as European City of Culture. It featured the European Arts Festival in 1995, marking Britain's presidency of the European community. Or indeed, the successive 
African arts festivals in 1995 and 2005. In the late 90s, the international spotlight fell on a new generation of artists, designers, and musicians. And more recently, there was the Cultural Olympiad with its strong and very positive message of diversity and inclusion. Meanwhile, consistent international exchange between organizations has been deeply influential on practice in this country. Think of the many theater practitioners that have come here, many brought to Britain by the determination and vision of the producer Thelma Holt. I remember Tadeusz Cantor's Dead Class brought to Edinburgh by Ricky DeMarco and by Peter Gill to Riverside Studios in the early 70s. The Russian director Yuri Dubyimov, who directed Climb and Punishment at the Lyric Hammersmith in 1983, a production that cost him his Soviet citizenship. Peter Stein, who's visiting productions of Chekhov and his work for the Welsh National Opera established him as a visionary realist. Ingmar Bergman, Robert Lepage, who showed us what epic theater could be, the market theater of Johannesburg, all of these have come to this country and they've changed our idea about what theater can be and they've shaped a generation of British talent. Stein was an important influence on Sam Mendes, Bergman on Katie Mitchell. They went on to influence theater, film, and opera globally. More recently, we've seen the Belgian-born Ivo van Hover, whose work, including his production of A View from the Bridge, is admired by the brilliant young Robert Icke, who comes from Stockton. This international exchange works across disciplines, the Wimbledon-born dancer and choreographer Akram Khan was a member of Peter Brook's company for the Mahabharata. This in turn shaped Khan's own work, which thrilled the world in the opening ceremony for the Olympics and itself inspired a new generation of choreographers like Akesh Adedra, whose company in Leicester has just become one of the Arts Council's national portfolio organizations. British dance has had formative relationships with, most obviously, Pina Bausch, Frankfurt Ballet with William Forsyth, Trisha Brown, Lucinda Childs, who was at Manchester last week, Merce Cunningham. Foreign conductors rejuvenate our orchestras, and ours do the same overseas. <coughs> Vasily Petrenko has revitalized the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra while Lithuanian-born Mirga Grasnyatila has become music director of the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. I know from my own lifetime in the visual arts just how international exhibitions and the chance to experience work from other cultures leads to revelatory moments for artists. Two generations of British artists were inspired by seeing Guernica hanging on the back wall of the Whitechapel in 1939. I wish it had been there in 1981, but it was there in 1939. And later by the legendary Matisse and Picasso exhibition at the V&A just after the war. These artists, these practitioners that I've been describing come from a social and political environment far removed from the experience of British audiences but they have shown us how art can both be eternal and passionately relevant to the moment. Think how experiencing such work in your own city, whether it be London, Glasgow, Manchester, or Hull, can change your perspective on life. A recent survey in Hull showed that 93% of the people in Hull had had some kind of arts and cultural experience this year. Don't think the figure would have been 93% this time last year if you'd taken the equivalent period. But it's that investment, it's that determination to see us spread the word of the arts and the experience of the arts to new audiences that makes the difference. 
70 years on from the first international festival in Edinburgh, exchange is flourishing. We have a network of festivals that co-produce, supporting British talent and bringing inward investment. Beyond Manchester, there are many others. Brighton, Bristol's In Between Time, Birmingham International Dance Festival, the Liverpool Biennial, and the South Bank International Festival. Festivals are for everyone. On Saturday morning, I was part of the audience at the welcoming party, a production for children and people of all ages by Theatre Rights, commissioned by Manchester in collaboration with the Ruhr Triennale Festival of Arts. And this is the image for the poster of that work. The contemporary story told in the welcoming party was of the movement of refugees and economic migrants from Africa to Europe, played out by a diverse and brilliant group of actors in a partly converted warehouse belonging to the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry. It brought cheers from a group of Somali teenagers in the audience and they, as they recognized themselves in the character of a refugee from Sudan. It's important that we should look ahead at what opportunities there are to expand this kind of global exchange and global interpretation. Today, the Arts Council is making available, and you can pick it up as you leave, a snapshot report that highlights some of the headlines around international work that the Arts Council supports. It shows the high level of interest in collaboration, commissioning, and taking artists and projects overseas, and it shows a significant increase in income from international work and connections beyond the traditional venues of Europe and North America. Last year, Organizations the Arts Council supports earned 57.5 million in international income and reached more countries and overseas audiences than ever before. Today, Richard Lambert, chairman of the British Museum, was telling me that earlier this week they had to close the National Museum in Beijing, where they're presenting an exhibition from the British Museum because they had 10,000 people in the building. The UK, the UK was the third largest exporter of cultural goods and services in the world last year, just behind China and the US. It's an important success story, but it still has enormous potential. UNESCO estimates that the size of the worldwide cultural and creative industry market is $2.25 billion, employing nearly 30 million people. That's a larger market than the GDP of India. The visual arts alone comprise over 300 billion, and the performing arts, 127 billion. The Arts Councils of England and South Korea have recently co-invested in a series of collaborations brokered by our partners at the British Council. Martin Fryer, the brilliant country director in South Korea, has worked tirelessly to make this happen. Two English arts organizations, Farnham Maltings and the Liverpool Biennial, are producing the English end of this collaboration. In the USA, the Arts Council will be developing new markets by a, through a presence at South by Southwest, a music festival that is now a marketplace for arts and tech. English organizations and artists will show their wares to thousands of delegations. We'll be working closely with the Great Campaign, with the Department of Trade and, Trade and our national portfolio organization, British Underground. Arts Council England supports these opportunities off by offering advice, contacts, and creative venture capital. 18 million pounds in grants from 2015 to 2018, with further funding pledged in future years. We should do more to support individual practitioners in the international arena. 
This April, the Federation published a response to the government's consultation, building our industrial strategy. And I was struck by one particular paragraph. The creative industries were defined in the government's 2001 creative industries mapping document as those industries which have their origin in individual creativity, skill and talent, which have the potential for wealth and job creation through the generation and exploitation of intellectual property. Individual creativity, skill and talent, a reminder that this economic success draws on the skills of the individual. That was the impulse behind our support for the Diaspora Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, where we supported emerging artists and curating, curators in the context of an important message about diversity. So it seems appropriate to announce that we shall be shortly launching a new fund that will support individual talent. The Creative Practitioners Fund will invest in the work of individuals. It will also offer support for research and development and encourage artists and producers to experience the value of working abroad. It will be a significant fund and we're currently finalizing the details and we'll share these with you as soon as they become available. I want to conclude by sharing a story. Last month, we announced our new national portfolio investment from, nine, from 2018 to 2022 at the Curve in Leicester. The Curve is a successful theater housed in a spectacular building by one of the world's leading architects, Raphael Vignoli. It works in what is now a thriving multicultural city. And it's now approaching capacity in, the terms of its, in terms of audiences. It needs new income streams. Later, in conversation with the directors after, we, after the launch, I became aware of how important international work has become for the curve. Since 2015, the curve has toured musicals, plays, and work for young people to Dubai, Abu Dhabi, South Korea, Ireland, Monaco, and Hong Kong. International work helps them to develop new partnerships and to generate returns with measured financial risk. The Curve's international touring has brought in nearly £500,000 in additional income in the last 18 months, contributing just over 200000 to their general operating budget, a figure that is not far short of 10% of their Arts Council grant. That international work is building a brand. It's contributing to the quality of what is seen by their audiences in Leicester. So here we have an arts producer serving its Midlands community and traveling regularly abroad. It shows the degree to which international work is now part of the lifeblood of arts and cultural organizations in this country. In 2015-16, organizations funded by the Arts Council took overseas 2,465 productions, 138 exhibitions, and took part in 329 festivals. The benefit comes back to audiences and communities across the country. It means more work for arts practitioners, more money for local economies, and inspiration for audiences. So we all have an interest in ensuring that this work flourishes and grows unimpeded. If we work together, we can communicate to others the immense opportunities and ensure that the next chapter of this memorable story unfolds in ways that will broaden our reach, strengthen our organizations, our economy, and bring enjoyment, new experiences, and indeed new horizons to our audiences. We look forward to working with you all. We look forward to working with the Federation. And I'm delighted to be able to be with you here today. Thank you.